Jose Palafox has been, um, has been reading the Declaration of Independence for the last five years to various groups. Jose was born in Mexico, and to show his patriotism and love for our country, um, he loves to read the Declaration of Independence. Um, he became a U.S. citizen while serving in the U.S. Air Force. So please welcome Jose, who's going to read the Declaration of Independence. Before I get started, um, if you indulge me, um, a little bit about me is uh, I was born in Mexicali, Mexico. I was five years old when I came here, um, so I didn't speak a lick of English. Um, I you know, went to school here in America. I never had to go to school in Mexico. Not that they would let me go to school in Mexico, but they're too poor for that anyway. Uh, but in uh, 1983, I did join the U.S. Air Force and while, while stationed in Omaha, Nebraska, I did become a U.S. Uh, citizen on July 3rd, 1986. It was the 100 year anniversary of the Statue of Liberty. It was given over telecast at the Mutual Omaha building and President Reagan was uh, overseeing the, uh, the actual citizenship. So for me, it's uh, very, very important to continue to uh, honor this country, tell people how much I love it, and, um, and just to, to be glad and thankful that, that I'm here. Uh, you know, a little poor Mexican boy that, that had nothing lives in a country where everything is possible. So, but before I get started on the Declaration, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, what Benjamin Franklin thinks about when, when they were in the Constitutional Convention in June 28, 1787, if you can picture it, it was pretty hot, kind of a Texas hot, like today, right? And they were fighting over whether not only had they already done the declaration and won the war, but they were fighting how to start this country. Uh, they were going back and forth, Republicans and Democrats, uh, right? Not like today, sound familiar? Everybody was arguing, nobody was getting anything done. Sound familiar like today? So, if you don't know me, I'm going to give you the speech that Benjamin Franklin did, and then I'm going to the Declaration of Independence. So here it is. Mr. President, the small progress we have made after four or five weeks close attendance and continual reasoning with each other, our different sentiments on almost every question, several of the last producing as many no's as yeas, is being thinks a melancholy proof of the imperfection of the human understanding. We indeed seem to feel our own want of political wisdom. Since we have been running about in search of it, we have gone back to ancient history for the models of government and examined the different forms of those republics which, have been formed with the seeds of their own dissolution. Now no longer exist, and we have viewed modern states all around Europe, but find none of their constitutions suitable to our circumstances. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, and scarcely able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have not here to once thought of humbly applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding? In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, we were sensible of danger. We had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. To that kind providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national felicity. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they that labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concerning aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the buildings of Babylon. We shall be divided by our partial local interests, our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach by word down to the future ages. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter, from this unfortunate instance, despair of establishing governments by human wisdom and leave it the chance for in conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business, and that one or more of the clergy of this city be requested to appreciate in their service. By the way, it didn't pass until three, three weeks late. So 
If you can imagine, that's what the forefathers were thinking. I think today and age, sometimes we forget where we started. So here's the Constitution and why I like to read it every year. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature, and a nature of God entitled them, a decent respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these, of these ends, is the right of the people to alter, to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles, organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate the government's law established should not be changed for the like and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to the right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object convinces a design to reduce under an absolute deputism, is it their right? Is it their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for the future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present kingdom of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object the establishment of absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to the trans world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation so his assent should be obtained. And when, no, and when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the repository of their public record for the sole purpose of fatiguing them in compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing mainly firmness in his in, sorry. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly, manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected where the, by the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of the invasion from without and convulsions within. <coughs> he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for the purpose of obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent up to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount of payment for their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices, tent killer swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without consent of our legislature. He has effected to render the military independent of the superior to civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and acknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to, us, to their acts of pretended legislation. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by, mock, by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in the neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries, 
so as to render it once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our government. For suspending our legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolate, and desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous, barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and their brethren, or to fall themselves by their, their hands. He has excited domestic insurrection among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for, for redress in the most humble of terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may be defined a tyrant is unfit to be ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempt by the legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the tides of our common kindred to disavow the usurpation which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. I don't know. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies of war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions due in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies. I almost got through it. <laughs> that these United Colonies are right ought to be free and independent states, that they are dissolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is not to be totally dissolved, and thus, and that as a free and independent state, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may have right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we usually pay to each other our lives, our fortune, our sacred honor. Thank you, Jose. I think sometimes we forget amid the fireworks and the parades and the barbecues what the 4th of July is really about. And so thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs>